Be careful where you go poking around. You just might run into more than you've bargained for. Desperate for independence but short on cash, 26-year-old Jamie Miner found herself couch hopping after leaving her job at Perry's Steakhouse. Not long after, she began working at Trace Restaurant in downtown Austin, Texas as a hostess and her new job seemed to be going well. That is, until her shift on May 23, 2011, when Jamie's supervisors noticed she was acting a bit off. Her behavior turned from strange to downright erratic, and her manager sent her home, calling a friend to come pick her up. But before her ride arrived, Jamie had vanished. She was reported missing on June 2nd, the same day several of her belongings were found in the Norwood Tower, which sat above Perry's Steakhouse. Surveillance footage revealed Jamie's last known moments were spent walking to Perry's, possibly to meet with friends. However, upon arriving, instead of using the front entrance, she tried two locked side doors before accessing the building through the duct system on the third floor of the attached parking garage. Nearly three weeks after disappearing, police opened the air duct pathways and found Jamie's body trapped between the first and second floors on a steep incline she could neither back out of or move forward through. The duct was located in a remote part of the building, so it's likely no one heard her cries for help. Jamie's motive for crawling into the air system is unknown, though her parents reported their daughter struggled with bipolar disorder since her early 20s. Police didn't see any signs of foul play and believe her death was a horrific accident. On September 20th, 1987, a worker at the Georgia Pacific West Paper Mill noticed abnormal temperature readings in chimney number 9 of the factory's boilers. So he went to investigate, only to be met with a gruesome sight. There, atop one of the boiler pipes were charred skeletal remains. Local police in Bellingham County, Washington found that, due to the immense heat, which often reached 370 degrees Fahrenheit, any DNA evidence was destroyed. The bones were able to tell them that the victim was male and between the ages of 27 to 37 years old. Many of the bones were also broken, indicating the unidentified John Doe had fallen down the tall chimney. Reaching the chimney could only be accomplished by climbing long, multiple flights of stairs to the top of the building, so authorities were forced to consider foul play. The only clue to the body's identity was a baggage claim ticket to a Continental Airlines flight which was too charred to be traced back to a particular passenger. Since the chimney was only checked every so often, the man could have been trapped inside for days or weeks if he survived the fall. This John Doe may forever remain unidentified. Cryotherapy is the latest trend in skin and body treatment and involves standing in a chamber that exposes the body to arctic temperatures as low as negative 240 degrees Fahrenheit. The treatment only lasts a few minutes, but its alleged benefits of accelerated muscle regeneration and improved skin tone make suffering the cold seem worth it. Almost. Rejuvenice out of Las Vegas, Nevada offered several types of cryotherapy. 24-year-old Honolulu native Chelsea Aki was working at Rejuvenice in the fall of 2015 and according to friends and family, was very passionate about her job. While closing alone on October 9th, Chelsea decided she wanted to take a quick dip in one of the deep freeze units to relax her sore muscles before heading home. The next morning, upon opening shop, Chelsea's colleagues were horrified to find her body inside of one of the chambers frozen solid, though she hadn't been frozen to death. According to the coroner's report, Chelsea died from a lack of oxygen while trapped inside a chamber full of liquid nitrogen. Her death had likely been swift, but this came as little consolation to her family. Rejuvenize Spa, along with another cryotherapy treatment center, were closed following Chelsea's death, and skepticism about the benefits and safety of cryotherapy is still on the rise, even years later. 
They say college changes you as a person, but when 22-year-old Melissa Joy Dietzel came back from studying at Brigham Young University, it was obvious to her parents that the changes were alarmingly negative. Melissa wasn't sleeping and she spoke frantically, even in normal conversation. She assured them it was just a result of the busy college workload, but her parents suspected she was fighting an unspoken mental illness. In the fall of 2011, she jetted off to Australia with a six-month visa to work as a live-in nanny. However, not long after arriving, Melissa was let go after she started getting upset that she was hearing voices in her head. The family assumed she would return to the United States, but Melissa missed her flight and was nowhere to be found, prompting her family to report her missing. Then, in January 2012, in the Randwick suburb of Sydney, neighbors complained of a foul odor emanating from a nearby oak tree. Thinking it was a deceased animal, a tree specialist arrived on scene and was shocked to find, instead of a creature, the deceased body of Melissa in the branches, 30 feet above the ground. Authorities confirmed her identity from her dental records and clothing and estimated she'd been in the tree for nearly two weeks before she was discovered. While authorities aren't sure how Melissa came to be in the tree, they treated her death as a suicide, a word her family was all too familiar with. The Dietzels had lost Melissa's brother Jared to suicide at the age of 24 following a bipolar disorder diagnosis. Melissa's parents believe she too was suffering from the onset of bipolar disorder and had tragically succumbed to the same struggle as her brother. In January 2016, within the Enugu state of Nigeria, workers were laying the foundation for a new community church. The project was allegedly overseen by a man who claimed to be a servant of God. However, some of the crew heard whispers of nefarious, deadly acts involved with the construction of the church and wondered if their boss was a wolf in sheep's clothing. One of the men working at the site heard rumors that dead bodies had been laid into the foundation and he was able to tip off local authorities before the concrete was poured. Several hired laborers tore into the ground and made a grim discovery. Three bodies lined up in shallow graves. After a more thorough investigation, five additional human skeletons were located on site. The local Tricycle Riders Association, who offered public transportation, identified the bodies as three of their own drivers. The men had left their stations on a recent Saturday night and were never heard from again. In March of 2016, authorities arrested a man they believed was responsible for building the so-called church. There were rumors he was not a man of God at all, but a ritualist who had commissioned the workers to bury the bodies of the men. One might expect to find human waste at a sewer plant, but the workers at a plant in Carson, California were horrified when they went to investigate a plugged line on October 26, 2013 and found the severed legs, feet, and pelvis of a woman's body blocking the way. Investigators were called to the scene and eventually located another arm days later, but the torso, along with the head and remaining limb, were still missing. Then, on October 28th, two days later, another clog appeared at a different sewage treatment plant in Industry, California, over 30 miles away from Carson. Workers found a torso and head in the remaining arm clogging their systems, and police knew they'd found the rest of the body. Both the sewage plants were connected by the same lines, and investigators believe that's how the remains ended up in different locations so far away from one another. DNA tests positively identified the body as 27-year-old Aaron Lynn Cruz, who was last seen on October 23rd of that year. While the body's dismemberment happened post-mortem as a result of being pushed through the pumps in the waste systems, police suspect Aaron might have been killed and dumped in a manhole. As of now, though, no arrests have been made in connection with her disappearance or subsequent death. In December of 2008, 31-year-old Raven Joy Campbell found herself in a new living situation, but not an unfavorable one. She moved into the Harbor Hills Public Housing Complex in Lameda, California with her friends Nicole and Randolph Garbett, along with Nicole's boyfriend. But not even six months after moving in, Raven suddenly vanished. 
Family found it suspicious that Raven's purse was left behind as she was very particular about always having it slung over her shoulder. But authorities had no leads and the case soon went cold. Seven years later, an anonymous caller contacted the Campbell family and told them that Raven might be buried within a wall inside the closet of the apartment complex, the same spot where neighbors had complained of a foul smell for years. Authorities brought cadaver dogs to sniff out the area in question and they received a positive hit. Tearing into the wall, they uncovered the remains of Raven Campbell. The autopsy labeled Raven's death as a homicide. She'd suffered a fatal blow to the head from a hammer. Her ex-roommate Randolph was arrested in February of 2016 and is charged with murder. Further details have yet to be released. Nothing about the morning of August 8, 1886 seemed strange to Edward Turrell as he walked his dog through the Parker Farm District in Wallingford, Connecticut. That is, until his dog sniffed at a large shoebox concealed beneath the brush. The box measured 30 inches by 12 inches, and the label said it contained shoes. But Edward caught the stench of rot at the same time his dog began whining, and he sensed something wasn't right. Edward and a neighbor opened the box, pushing the swaths of tar paper out of the way. Inside was the dismembered torso of a man. Decomposition told investigators he had only been dead for five to ten days beforehand and had died from arsenic poisoning. A month later, a farmer stumbled across the body's missing arms and legs, which were also wrapped in tar paper. Still, police had no clues as to the identity of the victim nor the circumstances of his murder. Rumors in the community spread like wildfire, with many believing Albert J. Cooley was the victim, a man who disappeared after stealing $1,500 from local slaughterhouses. However, Albert was later found alive. Authorities were able to track the shoebox to the Fall River Shoe Factory in Chicago. There, they learned an unidentified man bought that particular shoebox, but was never seen again. The body's head was never located, and everything about the homicide, including the victim and the murderer, remain a mystery to this day. In the city of Xi'an, China, lived a 43-year-old single woman residing alone on the 15th floor of her apartment complex. She mostly kept to herself and wasn't in frequent contact with her family, which is why no one noticed amidst the New Year's celebration that she had disappeared and wasn't seen or heard from for over a month. Repairmen were called to service the elevator in the apartment complex, which had been malfunctioning. Before cutting the power to the elevator, they hollered inside to be sure the lift was empty, without opening the doors. When they heard no reply, they assumed all was clear and cut the power. No one returned to finish repairs for 30 days. In March, when maintenance returned, they opened the elevator to find the deceased body of the missing woman who'd been trapped inside for over a month and had mangled her hands in her apparent attempts to force the doors open. While initial reports claim she starved to death, it's believed she more than likely succumbed to dehydration first. There were reports the woman suffered from an unnamed mental illness, but her mental state mattered little to police, who were concerned with the gross negligence of the maintenance men. This case was treated as involuntary manslaughter, and several people were taken into custody for the woman's death. On January 10th, 2013, 17-year-old Kendrick Johnson spent the first half of his day at Valdosta High School in Georgia attending classes as normal. However, when he missed a basketball game in the evening and never came home, his mother reported him missing. But she wouldn't have to wait long to find out the awful fate Kendrick suffered. The next day, three students found his body trapped inside a rolled up, upright wrestling mat stored behind the bleachers in the school's gymnasium. Along with blood and vomit inside the mat were two pairs of shoes. Kendrick's friends said he often stored things in the mats to avoid paying locker fees, and police believe he went to retrieve his shoes, only to accidentally find himself trapped. The coroner labeled his cause of death as positional asphyxia and said he'd likely been upside down for 21 hours. All this led investigators to conclude Kendrick's death was a tragic accident. 
However, his parents, Kenneth and Jacqueline, did not buy this theory and had their son's body exhumed for re-examination by a private pathologist. The second autopsy concluded Kendrick had perished from blunt force trauma to the side of the neck, cited by a bruise found there. The Johnson family was convinced two fellow classmates, Brian and Brandon Bell, were responsible for their son's death. But both brothers had alibis and claimed they'd been friends with Kendrick and therefore had no reason to hurt him. The family brought a lawsuit against the Bells and the investigating parties, believing law enforcement was involved in a murder cover-up. The lawsuit was eventually dropped, but the Bell family filed a countersuit for the defamation they'd faced from the Johnsons via social media. As of June 2016, the United States Department of Justice said there would be no criminal charges filed in relation to Kendrick Johnson. But whether or not his death was an accident or homicide, it certainly was tragic and has very clearly left a scar on his grieving family, who says they only wanted justice for their son. Before we go, I'd like to give a very special shout out to Loot Crate. Loot Crate has generously sponsored this episode of Twisted Tens. Loot Crate is a subscription box service that sends awesome and exclusive geek and gamer gear to your door every single month. And if you head to lootcrate.com slash rob and enter code rob, you will get 10% off of your first Loot Crate. Each month has a different theme, and last month's theme was magical, featuring gear from Doctor Strange, Fantastic Beasts, The Witcher, Harry Potter, and more. This month's theme is Revelation. Evolution, and it's packed full of gear from Mr. Robot, Firefly, Assassin's Creed, and more. So all you need to do is head down into the description below, press the link to lootcrate.com slash rob, enter code rob, and join me in the awesome Loot Crate community. And it makes a great gift, too. Thanks for listening. That's all for now. Don't miss my other videos. You can press on screen here to watch them. And of course, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my channel by pressing up here because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.